is a question for Mira. Why did you decide to move out and start making cinema or films from America or Africa, wherever? Um, I, you know, it wasn't uh, determined. I, I uh, started from theater in Calcutta and Delhi and got a scholarship to study uh, when I was about 18, 19 to go to Harvard and I went there. My parents allowed me to go because as my father put it, the Kennedys went there. It was a, it was a strange uh, rationale, but that's why I, I got there. And uh, <laughs> there, the, the, the theater was not at all politically engaged and I stumbled into documentary filmmaking and then fiction filmmaking. But I've basically, um, made films really largely about India, whether I'm based there or here, actively dividing my time between div two lives, between India and the West, and then married a wonderful Ugandan professor, and now Uganda for the last 18, 19 years has been an equal home for me. But movies and actually the learning of life, cinema verite was my, my, my background, which is this, to study life, the truth of life. And I made documentaries for about seven years, all based in India. But those were the days before documentaries became commercial and the struggle to find audiences was tenfold more difficult than the struggle to make those films, which really led me into making Salam Bombay. Again, and I think a deeply Indian film really based completely on the soil and streets and soul of Bombay. Um, and when that film, and until that film, even with the, my great, uh, the great teacher, Satyajit Ray's films, I mean, his films would be out there, but they would be in museums and sort of art houses, if at all. But there was no model to even go commercial with anything alt uh, with Indian cinema, alternative Indian cinema. And Salam Bombay kind of started that and proved that it was possible. And once that was became the success it was, I just followed my heartbeat with cinema where, wherever I lived, basically. But it is India that I come back to for, for it just fuels me with so much inspiration. Um, but I am now quite fluidly in three worlds. Um, but um, that's how the beginnings happened. But I never, it's, it's, not, it's not even that I think of myself actually as an immigrant because I have an Indian passport full of accordions of visas. It just goes on and on and on. Mm -hmm. But it's hard for me to give that up and because I'm so much in my soul kind of rooted here. But the interesting thing is that I'm fluid and I can use economies of both our home here, or Bollywood as it's known, but also Hollywood. But I think the, it's, my roots are still as strong as possible, which is why uh, Shantaram can come to me, um, and I hope and, and I really believe that I'm the one to do that justice. If it would, they would give it to a Gora, I would just probably shoot that Gora dead. <laughs> but uh, I don't mean that really. But um, you know, it's about time we get the continuum between East and West correct. And uh, a lot of times, situ people in that kind of realm of power of having a hundred million to make a movie uh, don't get it right because they don't know where we come from. So that is the advantage of being able to be fluid. Uh, as long as I keep um, the fluidity as my anchor, I believe I can make my best work. Hello, I'm Suja Isaac from Bangalore. It was really great hearing all of you speak. I just have a question. Is it, uh, you know, in the days to come, when you talk about freedom of expression, is it possible for, you know, movies or any form of art, you know, in media, which come through the effect it has on formative minds, is it possible to have some kind of a restraint on too much of negativity that could be portrayed? Because it has an impact on the future generations. Of course, it has its commercial value. A lot of people do it. But is there some kind of a responsibility that you know, people like you can make who can, who can have a power over the entire media in, you know, in portraying the art form? Mira, you want to get that? <laughs> I think it was for you. Um, well, you know, I'll just give you my example. I mean, for instance, after 9-11, the, the whole sort of wave of Islamophobia that has begun and continues in, in massive waves where anyone who's Muslim is basically mistaken or referred to as a terrorist almost across the board and, and continuing. I was very, you know, sort of, I, I'm, I'm really obsessed with this uh, 
this what's going on and when I was asked to make a film on 9-11 there was 11 filmmakers who got together to do 11 minutes each on 9-11 and I wondered what could I do in 11 minutes that would complicatedly present the complexity of what we are going through until I read the papers every day and I found a true story that was remarkable about a Pakistani family who lived in Brooklyn for 25 years she was a high school teacher and he was a candy store owner and they had three sons and on the day of 9-11 uh, their oldest son did not come home and uh, the mother thought that it was just simply because they were Muslim he was put in detention and she wasn't actually overtly worried because he was a researcher in Rockefeller University he had nothing to do with World Trade Center but she also knew that he was an ambulance medic by training but she, she didn't know what happened to him and the days went on and they, he got they got more and more depressed by the absolute silence that the son did not come home until the FBI and the press began to talk about this son this 25 year old boy as the possible possibly the 20th attacker. And, and slowly in their neighborhood, they began to get ostracized. This woman who taught their children English began to be just not spoken to. And uh, six months later, they, their, their son's clothes were found in World Trade Center, and the mayor called up and, and uh, said, you know, he had, he, was now, he had gone there to help, uh, to be part of the ambulances, and never came out. He died in the, in, the, in, the, in the crash of the building, and they declared him a hero in New York, and they gave him a big state funeral in the, Islam, in the synagogue in, in Madison Avenue, and the mother took the microphone, and she said, first you call my son a terrorist, then you call call him a hero, is this the price that I pay to raise a compassionate human being? And those were the 11 minutes that I filmed with the family's blessings, with the great, uh, with actors from here, Tanvi Azmi played the mother, and the mother also was cast in the film. And it was a kind of amalgam of exactly what happens in life, of what, you know, the, I always believe that truth is much more powerful and stranger than fiction. And it was an amalgam, in much of my work, I amalgamate the two. And it was a, it was a way to try to make a statement about violence in this country, in this world, and about what we have to do, you know, how at least I am very devoted to making a cinema that makes one question, that holds a mirror to the world, but also makes one question as how, do, how we see the world and how m people make us want to see the world. So that's where I come from in terms of uh, using cinema to open that door and to question that violence. Please, Mr. Mediator, can I ask two questions? Yes, please. Thank you. One A and B. Yeah, so A, Mira said that by making something truly local, you make something very universal. So how come all our Bollywood films, which are very local, ha are, have not been as popular as internationally as Monsoon Wedding? Ask the ones who make them. <laughs> <laughs> uh. Yours have been popular, sweetheart. <laughs> but, but maybe you should answer that. Uh, well, we actually, you, do you know that eventually, when we call it an overseas audience for our cinema, 90 to 95 percent of the inflow are Asian. You know, it's really only 5% uh, that are not. And when we talk about that also, there's a breakup because in the United Kingdom, uh, we have a, a, our theatrical chain is international. We have The View and The West End that gives us that kind of support. But in North America, our films don't release in any of the international chains. We don't get that kind of support. So therefore, not that kind of presence or publicity and nobody's really, North America is relatively, um, I would say, ignorant about our existence. Um, and it's, we get much more support in the United Kingdom and in Europe, but not in North America. So our films are predominantly viewed um, by just the Asian audiences. So our figures will always be, uh, the highest we'll ever do in North America is $3.5 million or $4 million, which is the highest business any Indian feature Bollywood film, as you would call it, has done internationally. But they don't work beyond that because All we don't... three being current films. All right, thank you. Uh, but they haven't done beyond that because we don't have the presence. We don't have the cinemas. You know, we don't know. Uh, we d it doesn't reach out there. We don't... And, and rightfully so, maybe for them, because they have so many studio films and they have studio links with each theatrical chain that they have to accommodate their own films first, you know, before they can... They can go beyond that. And even international films have studio support, whereas our films don't have that kind of, you know, you don't have like a Focus Features or a Warner mm -hmm. Brothers who are distributing our films. We have a Yashraj films that don't have that kind of presence with the studios and therefore not with the international chain. So we'll never go beyond that till we get a certain presence uh, in the distribution network. 
So we'll never be able to achieve those figures. Whereas uh, I think uh, with Mira's films, they are international films as well. I mean, there is a certain, uh, Mira is an international filmmaker and there are studio support. There is a certain sense of uh, that kind of, uh, you know, uh, infrastructure, which doesn't exist with our cinema. But also maybe, you know, our cinematic vocabulary, which we call yes. Bollywood, is local as you, as you use the word. Um, but it is our own style, you know, it is our vocabulary which needs, you know, a few hours, it needs songs, it needs dances, it needs sort of archetypical villains, it needs, you know, very, it's, it's the reason it has crossed so many borders in half the world, not necessarily the Western world, but in half the world for more than almost a hundred years. So I really take power in that and I believe it crosses over. But in terms of the Western world, uh, it is still a foreign cinematic vocabulary. And I'm talking not the diaspora in the Western world, but the but the, you know, the, the Koras in the Western world, um, it, the vocabulary is just a different vocabulary. They are not yet uh, used to uh, that kind of, um, the broad strokes of it, the, the, the musicality of it, the, the length of it even. Yeah. So it's, it's a different vocabulary. It might be local to us, but it is really not local actually in the way I, and I was mentioning in my cinema, which is really local in the sense that it's so specifically, take, take Monsoon Wedding, so specifically Delhi, but it is about any, uh, you know, people relate to the fact of being harassed by their daughter's wedding and what will it, what will it cost them or whatever those the humanity of it is very translatable but the vocabulary the cinematic vocabulary is also translatable with Bollywood cinema it's not that translatable because the vocabulary of cinema in it is different you see we have a format of our own you know we stop a narrative and sing a song it's not essentially a musical in that respect we're not singing our scenes really invariably we stop our narrative we sing a song then we're over three hours long you see always and you know when i when i showed kabhi khushi kabhi gum to an international audience and they were warned it was a three hour 35 minute film most of them said oh we can't come because you know we won't get dinner then at home you know because it's it's tough to go back then you have to spend a whole day with a film and for them for them it's really yeah it's like really spending a whole day it takes an hour to get there an hour to go back home it's like spending six hours of your life in a cinema hall so it's tough so as Mira rightfully put it it's also this the, it's the, the vocabulary yes of of our cinema that is unusual to them and you know it but that's just us and that's the way we are can I ask my second Good. question now this is for Abhishek um, I want to know what the secret um, that you have or how you dealt with and are dealing with overcoming the tremendous success of your father to find your own identity Oh, please, father and mother, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> and fiancé. And now soon sister as well. You're doomed. <laughs> I think... Um, the best way to deal with it is don't deal with it. I never addressed it. I remember that um, I was doing my first film called Refugee. And I was about to do my first shot when all of a sudden it dawned on me that the neighboring two villages, we were shooting in just outside Bhuj in Gujarat, the neighboring two villages had come to the shoot because they got to know that Amitabh Bachchan's son was shooting there and he was going to give his first shot and the entire cast and crew arrived even though they weren't working and they were all just, you know, staring at me. And I completely panicked saying, oh my God, they're going to call my dad and tell him that he can't act. And, uh, you know, what are people going to say that, you know, such a great, such, the son of such great artists just has no idea what to do. And um, I completely messed up that entire day. I couldn't work. I had a panic attack amongst other things. And when I got home, I was just evaluating how the day went. And um, I thought to myself that if this is how I'm going to be behaving, and if this is what I'm going to be thinking of, I'm not going to concentrate on my work. I'd much rather use that energy and channelize it to do my work to the best of my abilities than think about um, the responsibilities. I think that is something you have to hope that has been ingrained into you as a child. And just um, not think about these things because they're not important. What's important is what you do in front of that camera. And um, that, if you do to the best of your ability, the audience will respect that. And um, I remember my first film was up for release and Mr. Yash Chopra called me and he said, uh, I know you must be very um, nervous, but remember, your name is only going to take you till your first show. The minute they walk into that, they're going to judge you for what you are. So the best thing is just don't think about it. Uh, don't think about, you know, the pressures on you because that pressure is not willed on to you by your parents or by your fiancé or by your sister. They're, they only support you. 
wholeheartedly. I think you have to just go there and do the best you can and don't think about it. And you'll see that if you're good, then um, you'll overcome it. And if you're not, you're going to crumble under it and then you deserve to. And very well answered. I'm, I'm Ravindra Agrawal. Well, my question is to Mr. Karan Johor, basically. After Kabhi Khushi Kabhi Gam, mm -hmm. where you've shown the Indian heritage and culture, uh, family love and affection, brotherhood, and all those things, thereafter you have deviated from that uh, Indian heritage and culture. <laughs> do you feel, now my the real question is, do you feel that the Indian heritage and culture, the brotherhood, the love and affection in the family has become irrelevant for the cinema? Or is it not a message which can be conveyed by the Indian culture and the heritage, the Indian civilization to the world at large? I actually... I just want to start <laughs> that by saying that I want to say that if you see Kabhi Alvid and Akena, there's a great relationship between my father and me, keeping in mind Karan's motto of it's all about loving your parents. So he hasn't lost that in any of his films. <laughs> It's still about loving your parents, just not loving your wife as much, but <laughs> it's still about loving, loving your, your it's still about loving your parents. From loving your parents as, to as leaving your wife. As long as that's in, in <laughs> thing, you're fine with it. <laughs> yeah, from it's all about loving your parents to leaving your wife was a drastic departure. But um, uh, I actually believe uh, really that Kabi Alvidana Kena, to answer your question, is really my most relevant film. And I believe it's my most traditional film. I actually have an underlying message that I was trying to convey through my moments on celluloid. And uh, if at all what was picked up was just what was on the surface, then I'm very disheartened because I had a strong message that was running right through the film. I, all I was really trying to say is that marriage is a beautiful institution. It's a wonderful place. And uh, it just should be ventured into for the right reasons. Ne it should never be a compromise. It should never be because of parental pressure, social circumstances, financial pressures, peer pressure, all the various reasons that we do get into this institution for. Both my protagonists get married for the wrong reasons. Both compromise their feelings and venture into spaces that maybe they shouldn't have. And then life catches up with them, circumstances and they, they behave in a certain gray fashion. Um, they, they, they kind of, well, speaking um, in everyone's language, they cheat on their spouses. And uh, they find love in the end with each other. But I believe that when Dev and Maya, which is Shah Rukh and Rani, walk out at the end of the film, they're going to walk out very unhappy. They may be with each other, they, but they're going to be burdened by the guilt that they have caused, by, by guilt because of the, the, all the damage they've caused emotionally to so many members of their family. And I don't believe it's a happy ending. I may have shown them together, but I don't believe that they would be happy. So I was trying to say various things, and I said certain, uh, the advice Mr. Bachchan gives to his daughter-in-law in the film, or just things that are said in the film, I felt were very progressive thoughts, and I believed that I was trying to say something very strong. A 50-50 kind of kind of a, a different Half people, half the people who got it praised it, and and they got the subtleties and the subtle nuances that ran through the film. And the ones who did reacted violently to it. And I had many, many people who wanted to almost kill me uh, when they saw the film and said very, very drastic things to me when they when they came out of the cinema hall. But I do believe, and I mean that with all my heart, that I believe it's my most relevant film and my most traditional Indian film. Because if you catch the essence of it, then you'll know how culturally and how traditionally rich it really is. No, that was very relevant. I never, I was not, I can't ever say it's irrelevant. It's a film about parents and parents are never irrelevant, irrelevant, <laughs> irrelevant. They're always wonderful and they're really the pillars of all our existence. So I could never say that. Uh, I'm Vineet Chaudhary from New Delhi. Since uh, you all amongst the corporate world here, my question is related to the There's a fair smattering of the film industry as well. Probably you quite strongly. Uh, you <laughs> have asked what world has done to the cricket, to the seeing it over years when we were and see what's been happening now. And it's a firm belief, at least in Delhi and in the north, that corporate world has killed the cricket. You heard the feelings this morning at 6 o'clock in the all kinds of channels. And now we see the onslaught of corporate world in cinema as well. 
And what I believe cinema is all about art, whether you're producing, whether you're directing, whether you're acting, it's all about art. It's so uh, my question is actually addressed to both of you here who operate from India. With corporate world, the Bombay Club now getting into the film industry, the future of this industry, or do you uh, you will have a similar kind of thing what has happened in cricket, sports and art? It's very similar, and all people present here today, you guys were not here. They Al Lewis speak yesterday evening, and what he said. What goes into making of Carl Lewis or Sir Richard Hadley's is just focus. Plan, focus, hard work. The moment you look at money, you can forget. Uh, my yeah. question to both of you. Um, first and foremost, I think um, it's unfair to draw parallels between sports and film. I think they're entirely different. Uh, in defense of the Indian cricket team, I'm sure we're all very disappointed that they lost last night. But it takes a lot to perform under the kind of pressure that they perform, regardless of how many endorsements you have. I think every member on that team, be it the most popular or the person who's least popular, gave it their best. And I don't think they compromise on that level. That's why they make it to that level, that they can handle um, not being able to compromise what they do because they have an endorsement or the corporate world is stepping into their life. I, I really think it's a bit unfair to really come down on the Indian cricket team and, and just say they've got too many endorsements, they should all be replaced. I disagree with that. It's part of the game. I think we have to accept it and move on and, and support them. I mean, I said earlier on this morning, I can empathize with them. I'm somebody who's faced uh, failure, how it is to perform under pressure, and it's very tough. And just to get out there and to keep your chin up and still try and do your best, and they are trying to do their best is very commendable. I don't think uh, the corporate world coming into the film industry should change the film industry is because the essence of the reason why the corporate world is coming to the film industry is due to creative reasons. They want to be part of the creative process. They want to help us translate that creativity onto celluloid and then thereafter onto the people. So I think if they try and compromise the basic fundamentals of what our film industry is and what it is that we do, I think they'll be trying to um, ax their own feet because you know, they'll be ruining the real reason why they're interested in our, in, in our industry. Karan? Yeah, I totally agree. I think, uh, like you said in the end, that you lose your focus. Uh, you, you just venture into to make a project. It's never going to work. It's going to fall flat on its face. And the, the result for that will be there for the world to see. So it is a balance of um, our industry is a balance of art and commerce. And of course, the whole corporate culture that is penetrating into our world is, of course, going to increase the economy and of course add and add a whole lot of monies to the industry what's going to translate positively to that is it's going to have a whole brand new brand of talent that was going to come in and start making films because they have now the support of these corporates but if the corporates are just going to make these projects and it's going to eventually catch up with them then it's never going to happen because the audience is a great decider and they're going to let them know immediately if the films are not working and if you have a series of unsuccessful films and it's eventually going to tell on the economy of the film fraternity so I think eventually it's only when you balance art and with that, because even the Indian film fraternity is basically a balance of art and commerce, so you have to balance the both. But if it's just much more commerce than art, then you're going to have the result to see. And uh, it's, going to, it's going to finally be told. So I think, yeah, I think you're right. I think essentially, I think um, it's never going to really take away from the kind of cinema that we've been making. Karan, Hi, Karan. This is, uh, this is Malvinder Singh. I just wanted to ask you, uh, you know, you were talking about your sales in America and doing three and a half and four million dollars and somehow your body language reflected you were pretty comfortable with that number, which I actually personally believe it's very low and I think the kind of movies we have and I think all of us here would be great fans of, you know, Hindi movies. Uh, what really stops you from doing more in the American market? What are some of the challenges you have? Uh, how do you plan to overcome those? And do you in the movie industry, all of you sitting on the dais, really believe and dream that at some point in the future you want to make sure that the day you release a movie in Mumbai, it's actually being released in every single theater around the world? 
I apologize for my body language, uh, but uh, to answer your question really, uh, that there are various challenges at the, at the distribution end that has to be met with. You know, we have actually been working at it through various international platforms, going and pitching our cinema and trying to get through, Yashraj Films has been my distributor for the past decade, and they've been making various, various efforts to get to make to get our films to release across North America. We've managed that six years ago in the United Kingdom. Now we're releasing our films in Germany and France and Poland. We've We've, as I said, managed those those international distribution chains, but we haven't managed to work uh, very well in North America. It still hasn't happened. Very sporadically, an AMC gives you one or two screens in one of their big in big cineplexes or multiplexes. But we have made every effort. We keep going up and down, um, and there are, of course. Um, events such as Fiki that's happening in Bombay between the 26th to the 28th, but it just keeps, these events just happen and nothing really comes out of them eventually. It's like we're combating piracy for the last 20 years and not much has really changed. So the efforts are being made by the film fraternity and we're trying our level best, as you said, to make sure that our films release on the same date across the nation. Like it has been happening with a lot of international films vis-a-vis -vis us. Like now we have simultaneous releases. Um, uh, you know, for, for the bigger Hollywood productions. But we're trying, and with every passing year, we make me as a representative of the film fraternity, Mr. Yash Chopra, and of the industry have been pitching it, traveling with it, going in groups, committees, you know, go and pitch our cinema. But it's going to be a tough uphill task, and we hope to combat it someday. We hope to kind of work very well with North America one day. We hope to be a namesake one day. <laughs> Karen, you also I? have to understand, sir, that um, an, a big Hollywood film would be released in about 3,000, 3,500 screens across America. The biggest Hindi film that has been released, I think, was Kank, which was 60. Karan? North America was about 100, over 100. Okay, 100 yeah. screens. And to do that kind of business of 4.5 to 5 million on just 100 screens as compared to 3,500 is very commendable. So the potential is there. But like Karan said, once we can overcome the distribution hurdles, I'm sure uh, Karan will be making many more millions. Also, it's actually any uh, world cinema by and large, be it French or German, or it, uh, the, the numbers are much lesser. You know, we kind of perceive them to be much higher. Actually, the business, what Namesake is doing is actually spectacular business for an, inter for an intimate film such as, it, such as it is. You know, it is actually mm. doing overwhelming business because if you see even a Pan's Labyrinth that was Oscar nominated or uh, The Lives of the Others, which is a German film which won the Oscar, the figures are not very high. What they do finally is not, is not huge. Sotsi, which won the Oscar last year, has done as much as one of our big Bollywood films. So. It's really a, a misconception when we feel that even a French or a German or a Polish film goes out there and does the numbers. It really doesn't because these are considered art house to the basic North American audience. So that's just the way it is. Yep. And Hello. basically success you know, talks, if they see that the namesake can make X amount of money, believe me, the American distributors, whether it's Warners or Focus or Universal or any of them, will line up to see the next Indian film yeah, in just, the hope that it could make that same amount of money. The models cut, have to be there. They just and only money speaks half, at that level. Yeah. Yeah. I have a mic here. Yeah, hi. Yeah, and my name is Rajesh, uh, this is for Abhishek. Uh, so congratulations on doing so wonderfully well and becoming a superstar here in India and with the Indian diaspora, really very proud of you. Uh, the question, since we're talking about global, the question is, do you aspire to be a truly global star? And if so, what will you have to do with it? And of course, wish you do. <laughs> um, actor is a better word, but um, Without any arrogance, I, I truly believe Indian actors, not just me, Indian actors are, are global. Um, apart from the fact that one out of every six people on earth is Indian, so one out of every six people on earth sees Indian films. I think that's a great testimony of being global. I, I've been with my father in different, different places where, like I said, you know, be it Cairo, South Africa, Southern America, Northern America, Europe, Australia, Asia, I haven't been to the North Pole yet, but I'm sure he's got fans up there as well. <laughs> so I think Indian, the Indian films do have a reach which is global. And uh, I truly believe we are global. Um, just because we might not be as written about as some of our colleagues in the West, that doesn't mean we're not global. And I truly believe Indian cinema is global. 
uh, there were reports, uh, some articles where, wherein I read about virtual actors coming into films. Uh, the question is, if that comes, of course, uh, directors, but it is definitely a threat for uh, real actors. And uh, also the related thing is, will it help Indian cinema become more global? One thing for sure, it will make the India Today conclave very boring. <laughs> we'll soon have a virtual audience and that's all we need. <laughs> no, I don't think that's ever going to happen. The magic of cinema are the brilliant actors who depict every little moment that we conceive on paper and then project it on celluloid. And I think the concept of virtual actors can ever, ever, ever exist. I mean, it's really something that will be a god of computer graphic, but it's never going to really happen because it's, cinema is all about people, people watching it, people acting in it, people working on the film. And if you lose that, you're going to lose cinema and we don't want to do that. The enormous power of cinema is the validation of seeing people who look like us on screen. And if you put, you know, virtual anyone on screen, it doesn't do that. It exists on a level of a cartoon or a caricature or a game. But people want to see ourselves on screen. We want to have that heartbeat. We want to have that laughter. We want to have even the tears of it. I don't think any doll can do that. Yes. Yes. All right, we just take that one last one and we just have to run this comment. One. Just quick comment. Uh, I l love what you do and I'm other half of the 50% of Kapil Vidana Kena. I love it. All right, lovely. Uh, <laughs> and uh, in the true go global sense, I was just last week in Accra, in Ghana, and the taxi driver was black and he was playing this Kapil Vidana Kena. That's kudos, go. man. He's, he's Keep it up, guys. Thank you. He's happily married, I'm sure. Thank <laughs> you. <laughs>